It's time now for the Sports Objective Podcast. No talking heads, just guys who love sports. Here's Dave Richmond. Welcome into the Sports Objective Podcast. A big week for the Pirates. I'm Dave Richmond along with Kyle from the Grange Barber. How are you, man? What's going on, Dave? How you doing, dude? Great to have you. And uh, we have a late Bubba Rosenbaum. Let me get him in. All right, Bubba Rosenbaum, what's up, dude? What's up? <laughs> Well, we're recording to the podcast, and we have uh, yes, we have Kyle from the Green Barber, Bubba Rosenbaum, starting off a uh, big week, guys. Is we've got uh, BMI coming in for the Pirates for basketball season. We've got for the men's basketball, we've got uh, Friday night at Navy in Annapolis for basketball, and then of course Saturday we have at SMU, and we have uh, for football. We've got uh, great guests lined up for basketball, don't we, Bubba? Yeah, also, also don't forget, uh, women's basketball, um, kicking off the Kim McNeil era on, um, uh, on Wednesday at 11 a.m. Education Day. So you'll have, what, at least about five and a half, six thousand, uh, elementary kids, maybe some middle school kids from, uh, Pitt County and the surrounding areas. It's going to be great this whole week. It's, uh, basketball. I love this time of year because you have a lot of different sports. Playing and uh, wrap. We had the World Series wrapping up. My Nationals winning. We but uh, you have NASCAR going on, football, hockey, basketball. Like, everything is going on right now. I love it. So uh, certainly one of my favorite times of the sports year. And Kyle, I tell you what, I know that uh, I know that you about had a heart attack. I want to mention this really quick, and we'll move on. But on Saturday night with that game, forty six forty three, you got to be happy with uh, your football team. Well, I'm happy with the way we played, not happy with the results. Um, it was a uh, heart attack isn't really the right word. It was uh, more heartbreak. Uh, it, you know, to see the boys play that well, see Shane Carden have just by far the best game of his career. It may not have any, another game in terms of – it probably won't have another game that good statistically the rest of his career. Uh it was a shame that the pick six, because you can't blame it on him, because without the way he played, we wouldn't have been in the game to begin with. So I hated to see him have that pick six, because he played the perfect game besides that. And it's just just disappointing and, and sad to see him, to see that the, the entire football team put forth that kind of effort against the 17th ranked team in America. Nobody gave him a chance. Um, and for them to come that close to, to pulling off the upset and just just didn't make the plays down the stretch in the fourth quarter that they needed to, and Cincinnati did, and it comes down to one team knows how to win, the other team doesn't. Uh, it's just a shame, but get back after Saturday against SMU with another shot at the top 25 team. And not only that, uh, that third down, the, the guy was definitely holding C.J. Johnson's jersey. So He definitely definitely was. It should have definitely been a pass interference call on that or at least a hold, one or the, yeah. one or the other. And, and we'd had a but they did it all with, game. They were, I told you guys. The end zone. Yeah. yeah, exactly. I told you guys that they were hanging on him like a cheap suit all game long. But the good yeah. news is they started to, uh, they started to call that. And, and as uh, East Carolina gets better, we'll get that call more because that kid is very special. And the good news is for the Pirates, uh, gentlemen, is the very fact that there's a lot of uh, inexperience on the team, but there's a lot of talent. A lot of young players are playing. And when you look at two years down the road when Holton's a senior and you have a uh, C.J. Johnson and all these guys, Mooney, all these guys that are freshmen now, they'll be juniors. Oh, my gosh, upperclassmen. I can't imagine how great this team is going to be then. Yeah, yeah. Um, no. Looking at things and just one of the things, and we all talked about this um, on Saturday night, and um, we talked about it since, just the way uh, we did what we needed to do offensively from, uh, from the way we approached it as the, as the coaching staff, um, just throwing it more on first down and also second down uh, some, I mean, just not putting ourselves in – third and eight, third and nine, and predictable situations where we had to put it in the air. And so that was nice to see. And it was, it was you talk about guys playing with confidence. A lot of these catches that were being made, um, C.J. Johnson, um, Blake Prohl, also uh, Josiah Hatfield. Yeah. Uh, we, we were five yards away for, uh, or excuse me, four yards away. Josiah Hatfield had six for 96 um, from having three 100-yard receivers, and obviously C.J. had nearly 300. But um, <laughs> just 
they were making some very competitive catches. I mean, I mean, because a lot of those plays, Cincinnati had pretty good coverage. No question about it. And uh looks like uh, it's going to be a tough assignment. By the way, folks, in a couple of days we'll have our preview out, so um, probably by Thursday, so make sure you listen to that. I know that's going to be great. And uh, a lot of looking forward to the game at SMU. If we can play like that uh, against the Mustangs, they may be 8-1, and one, but if we play like that, we might have a shot to shock the, the whole college football world on the road. That would be amazing if they could do that. I, I think it's going to be a, t- a tall task, a tough order, but uh, after the way they played Saturday, if they can continue like that, hopefully that's not um, the pattern of playing well one game and not playing well. The inexperience, though, is what that's from, and uh, the guys like Jaquan McMillan and uh, even the sophomores like Trace Christian, I thought he had a good game uh, as well uh, running the football. But anyway, guys, uh, I know that uh, basketball is uh, hard to believe it's here, but uh, we've got the big game starting. Uh, we're going to drop this podcast being on uh, Tuesday, so the beginning of college basketball season. And I know, Bubba, we've got a couple of great guests, right? Yeah, we do, and we caught up with uh, Neil Punt. Uh, Neil played for the Pirates back in the, the mid to, to late 90s. Um, so he he was there, I guess, 95 to 2000, something like that, 96 to 2000. And so um, we caught up with Neil. He was a front court player, um, had very good junior and senior seasons, um, and I think as a senior, actually his senior year was the only year that he did not play for Joe Dooley. It was Bill Herrian's first year, and he had 10 and 6 as a senior. Um, and, and like we say in this interview, um, Neil was from Chanhassen, Minnesota, and he was a guy, he had a pretty interesting recruiting story um, where Joe Dooley sent him a letter down when he was um, playing in a tournament down in the Bahamas or somewhere, and they found a way to get it to him. But, uh, but yeah, we'll catch up with Neil. And then we also caught up with the head coach of the VMI Cadets, and, and that is um, Coach Dan Earl. So we caught up with him at the end of last week and um, got some insight on his ball club. That's going to be great. Plus, we were out at practice today, guys. That court looks absolutely gorgeous. And, and you know what else, Kyle? they've done they've actually the lighting on that court is absolutely i can't wait for you guys to see it it is just absolutely the best i've ever seen uh that court not only did they put that in, what was it that new the new graphics or they fixed the court they worked on the court uh certainly what was it back in the i guess it was the spring summer yeah uh, it's been yeah. a while it looks absolutely gorgeous in there and uh looking forward to definitely seeing the game uh tonight as we're dropping this podcast for their tuesday so uh, guys, uh, certainly, I know with uh, we can talk football, we can talk basketball, anything you want to talk about. Where do you want to go next? Because there's so much to to talk about, and uh, I know we we have uh, with a great guest lined up as well. Dave, before yeah. we move on to another topic, um, I just want to touch on what you're saying regarding the court. Um, I know you sent me some pictures of uh, Jaden Gardner, Miles James, and also Coach Dooley, and being able to see the court in the background. Uh, it it certainly is a huge upgrade, to say the least. Oh, it, it is. And Coach Dooley, uh, the commitment that uh, – I just want to say this. The commitment that our coaching staff has put in this program, you look at the commitment that the administration uh, – John Gilbert is just uh, – we talk about him all the time. He's not paying us money, but him and, and Ryan and all the guys there, they're putting a lot of effort in, and their hard work, their blood, sweat, and tears uh, as far as administrative-wise – um, it's, it's going to pay off, and it's going to help us with recruits. And you heard Houston, whenever uh, he had us walk around the facilities, he said, guys, uh, you know, we, we've got to do better with the graphics. And he was talking about, you know, what kids, the recruits, and what they want to see. And they, they pick their team a lot of, by a visual, uh, the graphics. And so there's a lot of uh, new carpet, paint, all kinds of stuff that they're doing on the in the ward building and, um, and what they're doing in Menji's and, was there going to be, I mean, just all the stuff, little stuff. Um, my parents always say the little things. Well, the little things they're doing may not sound like a lot, but it is when it's an 18, 19 year old kid looking to make the decision where they're going to be home for college for the next four years. We had a chance to go out to practice today with Coach Joe Dooley, and we also had a chance to talk to two players, Jaden Gardner, the sophomore, and Miles James, who was here and they're giving their thoughts and opinions 
and we'll come back and have more a great interview with coach Dan Earl but first let's go to practice right now coach uh, on the eve of your first game of the season what's the uh, update well I think we've had some some good days and some bad days I mean I think we've got to string together some some good days and uh, guys are getting a little bit better, but there's, you know, beginning of the season, you're never sure exactly what you're going to see from either team. How are you health-wise right now going in the first game? Uh, we've been better. We've been worse. I mean, we obviously we'll get Seth back, which is always good, and we've got a couple other guys that we'll see how, how the uh, doctors feel they're doing, but uh, they're making some progress. I don't know if they'll be cleared, though. Do you know who's maybe definitely out for tomorrow? Or we, we won't see well, him. tomorrow won't play tomorrow. Okay. That's, that's definitely. That's, that's, he, he's out. He's getting better, which is good news, but um, he's still got to make some progress. Are we questionable? Yeah, we'll see. That. We'll keep him going on that deal. So, what's your lineup going to look like tomorrow night? We're going to be. Uh, I mean, I think we'll, we'll obviously Jaden will be in the lineup, and, and Muji. I think we'll, we'll probably have a couple of freshmen out there, and I think that, that JJ Miles has done a nice job. I mean, Miles James has done a good job. So, I think we'll see probably a, a, some combination of those guys in the backcourt. With all the injuries going into this first game, just what are you looking for out of your team? Uh, just, I, I think uh, one thing is to to be tough and to, to play through and not worry about these injuries. I think the guys have done a pretty good job of, uh, you know, Tremont hasn't practiced with us yet this year and Seth wasn't with us for a while, so don't worry about those deals. Just worry about us getting better and uh, no one really cares if anybody's hurt. I mean, VMI doesn't care if we've got guys out, so we, the guys that are playing have better be ready and better be pre- uh, prepared. People make such a big deal about the starting five. Is it really that big of a deal or is it kind of just a starting group? Well, I think it's it's where they are. I mean, I think there's been progress by other guys uh, in the last week. You, you could see our big guys in the last 10 days have gotten better. Uh, Lou G and Charles, there's noticeable defensive deals. There's noticeable positional deals that they've gotten better. I think a lot is also dictated by a lot of matchups. I mean, you see with some of these early season games, we're going to be playing against people uh, which wasn't true last year that are actually smaller than us. So we can play small. I mean, I think you can see some lineups with Jaden, uh, Seth, Batumba out there all at once and, and playing one of those guys as a center, even though none of them are centers, depending upon matchups. And sometimes it's also hard to play centers in games. VMI has a little bit of size returning and uh, leaving school graduated out, I guess. Palm transferred to Georgia Tech, one of the Palms. Uh, okay, and then they've got a couple of guys back that are averaging double figures. You know, but, uh, Gil- Gilkison and uh, 15, and number two and number 15 are both double figure scores. they got two of their four leading scores back. The big kid Stevens, 34, is a big body guy. Uh, you know, Kramer is back up as a big body guy. They, they've got some guys. Now those guys do like to shoot threes, uh, but they're, they're all 6'8", 215, 220 pounds. But uh, they do spread the floor, shoot a lot of threes. Uh, they made 13 in their scrimmage against Radford, so uh, that's been a big part of their offense. With the uh, seven footers, the three guys, do you have maybe an idea or a plan of how to rotate, or if one is hot, do you want to just stay with it with him? Or, well, my or guess is early in the season they'll all be in foul trouble. So as soon as one gets their second foul, we'll put the, one of the other ones in. But uh, I do think, based upon matchups like we talked about, some of these guys, some of these matchups will be better for them because they won't be out on the floor as much. For example, Luigi is better out on the floor. Charles is probably a little stronger down in on the block. So based a lot of it will be based on matchups. Uh, how we'll play those guys. Joe, kind of adding on to Ronnie's question, how, with all so many new guys this year, how deep is your bench? How many guys do you expect to play on, on a regular basis? I think once we get into it, we'd like to play eight or nine, uh, which is the good news. I mean, I think we've got, you know, you, you, know, you, you would factor in that Seth and, and obviously when we get Tremont back, those guys will be in the rotation and Tyree. So I, I think the bad news is those guys have been out. The good news is that the other guys have gotten a lot of minutes and gotten a lot of reps in practice, which uh, is good news. Uh, it's also, you know, it's going to take some time once we get those guys back to get them back up to back up to pace. VMI is a little bit deceiving in that they got off to a slow start last year before winning four out of their last five to end the season. Um, what can you expect out of them in terms of how how much they've improved? A little bit? Well, I think the big thing they've talked about is how confident they came out of at the end of last season. They talked about that. I think that. You know, when you have a kid like Gilkison, who's a senior, and King, those guys are all, they've been through it. I mean, they're, they're experienced guys. Um, you know, they played well. They played Wofford tough uh, in, in the conference tournament for the first half. Played very tough, who, and Wofford was terrific last year. So I think there's a lot of things like that. You know, in the first game of the season, um, you know, they, they definitely feel like they're probably prepared. What do you think about some of the newness, even here? You know, the paint scheme and the graphics. Oh, it's so much. I mean, it's so much. I mean, it just, it's amazing with some paint and some, st- uh, some stickers. And lightening the court. I mean, the court looks so much lighter and brighter, and uh, just the concourses and, and even the, the stickers. We look around we, where we've marketed, we branded it. You know, you look around. There's so much better branding presence here in the building. That I think that, that our fans will notice it quickly. 
you mentioned in the preseason, potentially redshirting a guy at the injuries, put a kink in. The yeah, they have. They, 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 you know, we had talked about redshirting, uh, you know, some some guys, and I think with where we are with with injuries, it's unfortunately for us, it's not like football. You know, you can't play. You can play those exhibition games. You can't play in the regular season. So, um, you know, we'll see how that goes. And uh, you know, we we've planned over the next couple of years to hopefully redshirt some guys as we move along. So maybe it not might not be this year. It might be next year. Thanks, Thanks, Coach. Thanks, Coach. Thanks, Coach. Thanks, Coach. Thanks, Coach. Thanks, Coach. How excited are you? Ready to go, 7 p.m. Catches there. What do you know about the uh, They're a very uh, well sound team. They like to win the Princeton all games. They, like, they like to share the ball, and they run a lot of actions, and you have to get a lot of those actions. How do you think this team can improve from the start of the preseason to I think uh, just uh, every day, just getting tougher, getting missed, getting tougher, getting prepared for the challenges ahead. It's got to be nice to have some sides of the post with you this year to help out. Yeah, we're, we're definitely going to see a bigger impact, especially when we go into AAC play when everyone's basically a seven footer since eleven or sixteen. So it'll be a really good, really good impact. With the injuries here in the preseason, how is your team, your teammates, handled all this adversity? Uh, it's, it's a lot of adversity to some of our freshmen that are not used to being pushed into the role right away, and then when. Uh, Tremont and Pig get back, the uh, competition and practice will be better, and then uh, they'll be competing once again in practice every day. Having said that, uh, what's the chemistry like after a you know, little practice here so far? Chemistry good. I mean, work every day. Uh, we just keep building chemistry. Uh, we're like, you know, offensively, defensively, just don't worry about our own offensive player and defensively being where we're supposed to be. Like what have you seen from Tristan as a freshman run the, the points on? Uh, he's, he's a smooth criminal, I'd say. Like, uh, <laughs> He doesn't go. He doesn't appear to go fast, but he always seems to get by the defender. And, uh, he's very poised and uh, respect great things from us. All right, great gotcha. Thanks, Appreciate it. Thanks, you guys have put in a lot of work. So does it, does it, does it kind of feel like it's here? Or is it kind of a weird feeling? Uh, wait. excited because you know we all here for a reason. What's your as far as tomorrow, what's your pre game like routine wise or how are you maybe before the game as far as getting ready? So I got a playlist that I put on, try to isolate myself and focus on whatever coach is told us, focus on the uh, scouting report and just go play my game. Can we get a little more info on that playlist? Oh uh, <laughs> man, you know, got some West Coast, got some Nip in there, got some Meek Mill in there. Uh, some Stevie Wonder in there, uh, a little bit of everything. You guys, I've been preparing hard on this, but it's still kind of the last few days, game prep, you guys start getting more locked in, right? Oh, definitely, definitely, you know, it's here. We're going to lose, it's here to win, so we're really focused in, paying attention to detail, just getting ready to go. With all these preseason injuries, how has your team, your teammates handled this adversity leading up to tomorrow? It's definitely a loss. Trayvon Pig, those are Mark Souls, big guys in the lineup. But we still lift each other up. We still understand what we're here for. Let's keep going. Despite being somewhat new to each other, it seems like you guys really have a lot of team chemistry already built. Definitely. 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 Who's the best dunker on the team? Um, I think Pig is pretty exciting. Let's see how I'm getting off the ground. Um, Luigi, obviously, he's seven foot, but he's really athletic. Um, I like Tristan, too. Tristan is a little support point guard. So I'll go with those three. Okay. Is it nice to have the first game at home, you know, compared to having to travel or whatever? Get this from here. Is that good for y'all and fans and that type of thing? Definitely. I guess playing in front of everybody to show them, you know, what to expect this season. Being at home, no more. Let's see, we're here. Yeah. What do you guys feel like you've mentioned?
Thanks, Miles. Thanks, Appreciate Miles. it. Thanks, Miles. That's what Dave and did you want to go ahead? Uh, I know Kyle had to to leave the podcast. Do we want to go ahead right. and go to that and go to that interview uh, with the head coach of VMI, uh, Coach Dan Earl? Yeah, let's go talk to him. I appreciate him. He uh, he, he reminded me of his voice. I know it's because he's from Pennsylvania. Well, Bubba's heard to believe basketball season is here, and we're very honored to have our next guest. Yeah, we're just a few days away from tip off, and the Pirates will be hosting the VMI Cadets um, on Tuesday at 7 p.m. at Williams Arena Menchie's Coliseum. And now to get the VMI perspective, welcome in head coach Dan Earl. Coach, welcome to the show. Yeah, thanks for having me. I really appreciate it, fellas. Absolutely, Coach. We were just talking right before we started the interview. It's hard to believe that uh, the basketball is already starting when we drive the podcast tonight. And uh, here we go with uh, with you guys. I know you're starting on the road at the, the Pirates. I guess uh, for folks that don't know, VMI is a, I want to start off the interview with uh, because I'm proud of your school, the military, the Virginia Military Institute, VMI. Can you talk a little bit about that? Yeah, absolutely. Uh, it's uh, an honor and privilege to coach here at VMI. Um, I've kind of bounced around a little bit. I was at Penn State, my alma mater, and then the Naval Academy, which also obviously has a military uh, presence to the school, and then now here at VMI. And it's just a really good place. We, uh, you know, get to coach and recruit high-character guys, which uh, is kind of what our staff's all about as well, so it fits in well with the school. And uh, it's just nice that the, the kids are, you know, obviously well-behaved and I think work hard and have a little bit extra discipline and learn life lessons and leadership skills at a place like VMI that not all schools uh, give you the opportunity to learn. So it can be tougher. Um, we certainly have challenges because you know, you're trying to win basketball games as well, um, but it's an awesome, awesome place. Coach, can you talk about, uh, before we talk about, the work on the hard work. Can you talk about uh, for your cadets? Uh, can you talk about the what kind of day do they have? I'm sure it's a uh, is it similar to what uh, what the folks will be dealing with at the Naval Academy or one of the service academies for the, their schedule. Yeah, it's very similar. Again, I, I spent four years at Navy prior to getting the head job here at VMI, and it's it's a very similar day. Um, you know, it starts off with formation in the morning at 7 a.m., uh, so everybody goes to that. It's mandatory. Um, the kids are in uniforms. Uh, you know, they at different times have room inspections, and you got to look proper, all that good stuff. Um, but you start your day off the right way. And, again, for a mature kid, I think he says, hey, it's good to get a good breakfast in and uh, get after it. But as we know, not all college, uh, you know, people in general or athletes are – getting up for breakfast, you know, sometimes sleeping in through, through some stuff. So um, you you go to all your classes, which, again, is a positive. You get a great education here at VMI. Um, and then it's, you know, similar to most other schools in the day of, of lunchtime, and you might have a free class period or two. Um, the entire school, there's a physical mission to it. So um, at 4 o'clock, essentially, everybody is doing something physical, if you will. Now, our physical is uh, on the basketball court or weight room or strength and conditioning. Um, some of the people that commission here, and there's a physical mission to the school, so they'll do some more ROTC type stuff. Um, dinner at 7 p.m. Um, then, you know, like most uh, college athletes, study hall, and then shut it down the next day. Um, you know, so it's it's a little more disciplined, a little more strict of a schedule, um, but our guys adapt well, and uh, it can do wonders for the rest of your life. The education you get. Coach, I, I know you have um, a, or had a tremendous ball in Bubba Parham, um, a guard who averaged more than 20 points, knocked down well over 100 threes. He made the decision to transfer to Georgia Tech. But I know you also returned a couple of very talented guards that added, averaged in double figures a season ago. So can you talk about them? Yeah, certainly. You know, with, with Bubba, it was tough. Uh, you know, we had a tough spring in that he, I think he really enjoyed – VMI and, and our program and everything, and he was obviously uh, doing extremely well for us. Um, I think second team, Southern Conference leading returner scorer. Um, so that was difficult, um, but he had some stuff with his family and wanted to get closer to home. So understandable, but tough for our program. But, you know, as we move forward, you mentioned a couple other guys. We have some other guys with experience. Garrett Gilkison is a, you know, guard forward type. We, we play with, uh, you know, kind of just – four guard forward types and then a kind of a center, if you will. Um, so Garrett Gilkison's a senior, has some leadership uh, skills certainly, and is kind of an all-around player. He averaged about 11 points a game last year. Miles Lewis is another kind of guard forward uh, on the wing that uh, averaged around 11 as well, kind of a slasher and can get to the rim, provide some athleticism for us. Um, and then Alden Parham's another uh, point guard that started a number of games last year. 
um, you know, good decision maker, and uh, we're looking for him to take the next step. Uh, we're going to kind of have to do it together uh, rather than having uh, – I think we'll have some more balance, uh, but I don't know if we have one go-to guy for scoring every night. Coach, I know that you guys um, – one of the things I want to talk about, you play in a very tough league in the, in the SOCON, um, having being at East Carolina who plays in the American, and I know Coach Dewey is – uh, building things. What do you know about East Carolina? I know it's very early, brand new, the very first game, the inaugural uh, game of the 2019-2020 season for you guys and for East Carolina. Uh, but what do you know about Coach Dooley and, and what do you know about the, the Pirates? Yeah, great question. It, to be perfectly honest with you, I haven't watched a ton yet. Um, I know it's right around the corner, but we've been focusing on us and uh, heading into the weekend. I'll be doing more of that. But you know, obviously, I know uh, Coach Dooley. Uh, don't know him personally, but you know he's been in the business for a while. I think he's a Jersey guy originally. So, and I'm from Jersey, so we kind of, yep. you know, uh, like to say we get some toughness from Jersey. So, uh, but obviously, it's been a tremendous success both as a head coach and then uh, out of Kansas. So, I've seen a little bit of their style of play. You know, some of the high low stuff. And as you guys know better than me, um, it appears they have a variety of new players. I want to say 11 out of 13 are new players. So it's makes it a difficult scout. Um, you know, we'll certainly know some tendencies, I would think, of what they'll do style-wise, but uh, everybody makes tweaks based upon their personnel. So, And a lot of height, obviously, with, uh, I want to say, three seven-footers and, you know, a variety of different guys at the wing spots and, and forward spots. So, um, so it, again, tough scout, but uh, I know Coach does a heck of a job, and, uh, you know, we'll have to be ready because it'll be a tough game. Coach, you talked about your backcourt. Uh, tell us a little bit about what um – what pirate fans can expect to see out of the out of the front court. I know you said you like to play uh, four four guards and one center uh, a lot of the time, but uh, tell us what we can look for there. Yeah, certainly. So we, uh, you know, I, I mentioned some of the guys that'll play a variety of different guard or forward spots, and then you know some of our bigger guys. We uh, have a, a young man, Jake Stevens, who was a freshman last year. Um, he's uh, one of our centers, if you will. He's got good height. Um, not the fastest, uh, most athletic guy in the uh, in the nation, but uh, but knows how to play. You know, skilled. Um, another guy, Tyler Kramer, who's a senior for us. Um, they could both you know play together or um, you know separately. Both uh, he's a senior as well, about six nine, six ten, and he provides some rebounding for us and defense. Um, another uh, young man, Will Miller. Uh, we'll probably play some minutes as well. He's about six eight. So we have some guys up front, and again, it just depends on a little bit of our matchups and how we're playing. But uh, a lot of times we'll play with a smaller lineup. But uh, that'll be interesting against the ECU, as as you know, with uh, with all their height. And coach, I know that uh, I'm a scheduling nerd, so I know that your the most important game is uh, with tonight with East Carolina. Uh, but I looked at your schedule, and you guys, uh, I'm really excited. I love. I don't know. I'm a basketball nerd, as Bubba and our other coach uh, Kyle would tell you. Really happy to see you had the uh, coming up in a couple of weeks. The Red Wolves Classic, a chance for you to get four games in at Arkansas State. Yeah, absolutely. And and um, we sometimes will play in the they're called MTEs, you know, multi team events and. Uh, I think it's a good thing as you're moving your program forward to play in that kind of environment to prepare you for the Southern Conference tournament at the end of the year and if you're able to get into postseason play as well. Um, but just that kind of back-to-back uh, feel where you don't have a lot of time to prepare in between each game. So we'll play some somewhat like opponents and uh, go at it tournament style, if you will. And, uh, again, I think it prepares you for, for uh, the future down the road. I saw you have in-state rival ACC foe uh, Virginia Tech uh, in Blacksburg in December, and and then you have the uh, as I was talking about one of my uh, favorite conferences, SoCon. Uh, do you know anything about uh, the league this year uh, coming back with UNCG or Furman or some of the other teams? Yeah, certainly. So so um, you know Virginia Tech obviously they had the coaching change with uh, Coach Williams who did a tremendous job, and then Mike Young was in the conference at Wofford, and he's obviously taken over at Virginia Tech. So uh, an unbelievable coach, an unbelievable guy. So I wish him well, except when we play him, obviously, that night. But, uh, <laughs> but uh, they'll, they'll be tough, obviously, an ACC opponent. And then, as you mentioned, the SOCON. You know, I, I've been around the business for a while. My brother is the head coach at Cornell as well. He played at Princeton. So, you know, we've both been around a little bit. And every conference is tough, let's be real. You know, when I was in the Patriot League, it's extremely well coached. And, you know, you're playing against – like competition, if you will, but I've been, uh, I guess, I don't know the correct word, uh, unpleasantly surprised, if you know, but uh, at how good this Southern Conference has been, 
the, the past couple of years. Um, obviously, obviously, with Wofford getting a seven seed in the NCAA tournament last year, it just shows how um, how good our conference has been. And then you had Furman that was nationally ranked for a while, UNCG, ETSU. I mentioned all of them from last year. It looks like they'll be towards the top of the conference this year as well. Again, well-coached, tough teams. You see some different styles of play. Um, but then you get into the middle of the pack and some other teams, and they're very well-coached as well with a lot of talent. So, um, unfortunately for us, it'll be a great year for the conference again, and uh, we'll continue to try to get better and compete as best we can in the conference. And what does it take, in your estimation, uh, for to win the conference? I know a lot of coaches do like what you're doing. You have some nice opponents. You don't want to like be murderer's row where you – you have so many difficult non-conference opponents, but then yet again, you want to have some good opponents in there so that you get ready for the conference, right? Yeah, certainly. You know, and I, I think you uh, said it right. You know, you try to balance out your schedule to the best you can. So you play some big wigs, if you will, and, and try to test yourself and, and play in some environments where it can be a little louder and uh, – and, and, and fun environments for your guys, to be honest with you. And then uh, you play some other liked opponents uh, to where it's maybe similar to competition to see what you'll see in the Southern Conference. Um, and then, you know, like you said, with the Red Wolves Classic, the classic just uh, kind of a, a tournament-type atmosphere so that when you get into the Southern Conference, you're prepared for that as well. So uh, try to balance it out. And, uh, you know, it, it, all different teams are have different goals, if you will, and uh, we're trying to, you know, obviously win as many games as we can. And, uh, and just continue to get better as we roll forward. Coach, you've been very generous with your time, but before we wrap this up, um, after playing you guys and the Pirates will be traveling to um, play in the Veterans Classic against your former school, Navy. Um, so tell Pirate Nation um, what that event's like in a, in a nutshell because I've looked at some of the teams that have played in that down through the years, and like this year it has Auburn and Davidson as well, so it's a tremendous event. It really is. Uh, you know, Ed DeCellis, uh, you know, started that a couple of years back when we first got there, and I think it was a tremendous idea and just an awesome event. Um, uh, I think you guys are matched up with Navy, I believe, ECU is. Um, so yeah. it, it'll be uh, it'll be good. You know, they do a really good job selling tickets. It's a nice arena. Um, like you said, a, a back-to-back doubleheader, if you will. But as much as the basketball, and in the past they've had Michigan State, North Carolina, I mean, you name it. So they've done a really good job of it. But on top of the basketball, just for um, the, you know, opposing teams and players and staffs to see what it's like to be at a service academy and all that goes on. And uh, they do a good job of showing them, you know, some of the different things that the um, cadets go through um, and, and uh, you know, show them around and then they'll eat with them during the day and uh, see how they eat meals, family style, all that good stuff. So it's a great uh, opportunity, I think, for opposing coaches to kind of explain, you know, uh, sometimes, you know, people at other schools will complain, oh, I'm tired, I'm this and that. <clears throat> Some of the, you know, places at service academies, they're getting a lot more um, to do in their day, uh, you know, packed in. It's amazing what your body can do. Um, so I think it'll be a great experience for ECU and uh, and whoever else is in the, the Classic. In fact, that's the second game of the schedule for East Carolina on Friday night as we're dropping this uh, podcast uh, tonight, first game of the year. Coach, good luck tonight against the Pirates, and good luck to you the rest of the way, including the Red Wolves Classic and the SoCon. I know that it's going to be a, a very exciting uh, uh, season, and uh, we wish you guys all the best. Yeah, thanks a lot, fellas. I appreciate you having me, and uh, good luck going forward. Thanks for Coach. He spent a lot of time with us, and that meant a lot to me and Bubba, as I know he uh, is getting ready for tonight's game, and he didn't have to. So thank you, Coach, for – uh, for that, and uh, we obviously want the Pirates to win, but I hope they have a good season uh, there in the SoCon, and uh, certainly a great the basketball league. I love that league, and always have, and always will, for sure. Do you want to go to uh, to our next interview, Bubba? Yeah, in just a moment. Uh, one thing I was going to mention, um, kind of expanding on that interview with Coach Earl of VMI, um, and they obviously lost Bubba Parham, like we discussed in that interview on uh, him leaving to go to Georgia Tech and uh, see how he can do in the ACC uh, after averaging like 21 or 22 last year with the key depths and uh, knocking down 116 three-pointers. And uh, he, he had them uh, – there was a game against Kentucky where uh, I want to say he knocked down at least eight threes. May, it may have been nine or ten and poured in like 35 points in that ball game. Uh, so um, – and, and they, on, they only lost that game by like – eight to ten points so um 
that's one of those that really jumped out at you. But, but like I said, uh, he was a huge reason that the T-Dets were competitive against the likes of Kentucky. But um, it will be interesting, and they do have some uh, veteran guards returning, and we all know how important that is. And when you, you hear it every year at tournament time, hey, this team has solid guards. And, uh, they're a team to keep an eye on. So Pirates are going to have to show up and, and play and um uh, and certainly not take anything for granted. And this is season opener. I know that won't be the case. Joe Dooley and his staff wouldn't allow it. <laughs> but uh, hopefully we'll play well um, later on tonight and then uh, get that first win going into Friday up at Navy. It's hard to believe basketball season is here as we record this. Uh, it's just a little over 24 hours as the Pirates will be tipping off the season against BMI on Tuesday night, 7 p.m. at Williams Arena Minchie's Coliseum. And um, now Kyle Barber and myself are happy to be joined by East Carolina basketball letter winner Neil Punt. Neil, welcome. Thanks for having me, guys. I'm uh, looking forward to the season as well. Absolutely. We enjoyed catching up with you throughout last season and look forward to doing the same this year. Um, A lot has changed, to say the least. Uh, Eleven new scholarship players for the Pirates. Joe Dooley and his staff have been – turning over every stone on the recruiting trail and um, a lot more size and length on this year's club. Well, we said last year when when uh, Joe came came back, uh, you know, we said he was re- recruiting what's his strong suit, and he proved that this, you know, this off season. But what's really impressive to me is, you know, you touched on the uh, the physicality or the or the the changes in the the athleticism of this team you just look at the size of the guys we have now where you know we we kept mentioning it last year where Jaden at 6'7 was you know our go-to guy which is crazy at 6'7 to be you know as unstoppable as he was in the American and now you know you got point guards that are 6'5 6'6 6'7 you got Seth coming back we know his athleticism it's crazy, but, uh, you know, it's interesting because a lot of these guys aren't, you know, they're still young guys. So you're going to have a lot of these guys coming back again next year. So, uh, you know, as exciting as it was to start off last year with Joe coming back, it's, it's, it's really kind of a very similar take this year because now you're finally kind of getting his, his fingerprint, so to speak, on the uh, program. Neil, as talented as this group he is, and, you know, I was talking to South Seymour, and he said in his 21 years covering East Carolina, this is the most talent he's ever seen us have by far. As talented as the group he is, it's a bunch of guys that never played together before. How many games do you think it takes to, 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 to start to match as a team, to get your rotation together, to start playing together? You know, how long does that take typically? I mean, it is, you know, I guess it's different every team. Yeah, absolutely. It's, it's different every team, and it depends on your uh, head coach with how you're running practices. And, uh, you know, he probably has a pretty good idea, you know, with the changes in the rules with how, how long they practice now before they play games. You know, back in the 90s, in my day, you know, we didn't start practice until, you know, November, last week of October, November, and they've, you know, been at practice almost a month already, and you know, before their first game. So, these kids play so much summer ball and they're on so many select teams and so many AAU teams and they play in so many different tournaments. And some of these guys have, you know, they're on their second, third, fourth stop. They're used to being able to play. The nice thing about basketball is it's five, it's five guys out there. And as long as those guys complement each other, which ultimately is the responsibility of the head coach to recruit players that uh, play together and can complement each other, uh, you know, they can really put it together you know, in a matter of a week or two, you know, depending on their on the teams they're playing. Obviously, they got VMI tomorrow, and then they, you know, head up to you know the Maryland area for that difficult uh, tournament this weekend. They could really, you know, kind of stretch their wings here in the next week or so, and, and really see them turn a corner. Once they start having a little bit of success, it'll come real fast. Neil, as a front court player. One of the things I wanted to ask you, um, obviously, we talked about that link this year. Uh, and last year, Jaden Gardner in practice uh, didn't exactly have a ton of link to practice against, and that, that certainly uh, it's, it's amazing what he did um, considering that and then just the lack of a perimeter game. Uh, so I can only imagine the strides that he's going to make this year uh, with an improved perimeter performance and then also uh, guys like you have three seven-footers, Edger Luster, 
um, and then Muji Debo and also C.J. Coleman. And back in your day, um, there were the likes of um, Jonathan Kerner, also um, Quincy Hall and others. So, so talk about that and the difference that makes to, to have those other bigs to go against in practice. Oh, absolutely. It's huge. You know, for me, uh, you know, being 6'8", six, 6'9", six, coming out of high school and, and going down there, and we had, you know, Jonathan Kerner, who had a little stint in the NBA, and then you had Donnie Douglas, who a lot of people don't talk about a lot, but he was a big, wide body, 6'10", six, 6'11", six, you know, and then, like you said, later down the road, obviously, my roommate was Alphonse. He was a seven-footer, so for me, it was just all of a sudden walking around with people that are taller than me. It was the most bizarre thing in the world to me but yeah in practice you learn real quick and you could see how you know how we had to gear our offense even going against a team like UCF that had a lot of length and obviously Taco Falls a you know once in a generation talent with his size and the ability that he had but you could just see the difference that even you know going from a guy guarding you who's 6'9", 6'10", to a guy who's seven foot plus you know, the difference it, it can make. And, you know, we have lots of length, and I think a lot of teams are going to be surprised by our athleticism this year. Back in your days, um, something else I wanted to mention is um, obviously there, I guess, in the, in the first few weeks of the season, we had that trip where we're going down to the Bahamas and taking on the likes of the Evansville and then uh, potentially some other quality programs like um, – GW. GW out of the A10, and then also uh, maybe Liberty again, who we also have in Williams Arena Menchie's Coliseum. So um, I'm trying to think back on w- without having the information in front of me. Did you ever have the opportunity to do something like that when you were playing or holiday tournaments or w- where, where you had the opportunity to, to get away from campus and then um, build some team chemistry with extra time on the road? Yeah, absolutely. And and obviously, you know, back then being in the colonial, uh, you know, versus the American, uh, you know, we were kind of forced to kind of go and find those road games to start the year. Whereas now your VMIs and, you know, like we saw last year, all the teams out of Texas were looking for road games and they came to us. So it's a little bit different, obviously, the size of the program now where it was, you know, 25 years ago or so when I was there. But, uh, Back back in the day, they didn't have you know they had like the uh, Great Alaskan Shootout, the Maui Invitational, and they didn't so they didn't have a whole lot more than those tournaments. And that was always your Blue Bloods, your Kentuckys, your Dukes, your Carolinas. Uh, Wake Forest was always in those when Tim Duncan was you know when they were running the show there. Uh, but we went on the road, and uh, I want to say my freshman year, um, you know we would go on the road for a good week, week and a half over Thanksgiving because we didn't have school. And then again, uh, come Christmas time. So my freshman year, I think we opened up in, uh, up in Connecticut at Fairfield. Uh, we won that game on the road. I think we came home, went and played a uh, neutral site game against Campbell, uh, in Fayetteville. And then I believe we went, uh, hit the road and we actually went to Canada and played, uh, BU Boston up in, uh, Nova Scotia. And we were actually, we're in Nova Scotia for Thanksgiving. So, yeah, we used to do quite a bit of travel, and it was always enjoyable. And then we always seemed to play uh, every other year. We'd play, we'd play Georgia, and then we played at South Carolina one of my years. So yeah, begin, beginning of the year, we were always playing some bigger schools. You mentioned playing Georgia when you were here. Uh, I guess you were you on the team when, when Georgia came to Greenville, and uh, we we uh, we had them beaten, and they hit the free throws there at the end of the game to to win it. Yep, that was my. Uh, I believe that was my. Senior year, I believe. Um, I think that was Bill Herrian's uh, first year. I could be wrong. No, because my junior I, I, year we went to. Oh, go ahead. Oh no, I was, I was going to say. I actually, I believe that was. Uh, I want to say that was Coach Dooley. Uh, but cause it, it, I know it was. I know it was Raphael Edwards who was playing then. Yeah, so I, then it was uh, definitely my uh, my sophomore or junior year then. Because I think in Dooley's last year we went to we won at South Carolina and then a few days later lost at Georgia. So yeah, it was it was MNG's and Dooley was still there. It was in my head it was ninety it was like ninety five, but I could be wrong. Yeah, it, yeah, it was. Uh, I guess it was ninety seven, ninety eight, and and um, that's what I I recall that South Carolina game you referenced too, Neil. That that was one uh, we went cool, down huh? there. Yeah, went down to Carolina Coliseum where they were playing back in those days and beat them fifty six thirty four. I just remember they couldn't they couldn't uh, throw it in the ocean. 
Yeah. And, <laughs> yeah, and, they uh, couldn't do anything. That was a that was a team coming off the year before that they were making a push for a one or two seed in the NCAA tournament. Right. <laughs> so and then the next year they kind of came back and Eddie Fogler just couldn't. They just didn't have the chemistry again, but they still had uh, B.J. Mackey and all those guys that were on that team the year before. And it was a packed house over the holidays, you know, and uh, it, it was crazy. But it was it was a good time. But it was nice for us because we won the game, and it was a big game for Joe because Joe uh, was a coach, was an assistant at South Carolina. So that's how we got the got the game. And he actually was an assistant there with uh, he worked at Tubby Smith. That's how he got to know Tubby Smith, and that's what made our, our Georgia connection, why we had all those Georgia games, because Tubby Smith was the coach at Georgia before he went on to Kentucky. Right, right. And um, and obviously, while we played high point last year. Yeah, absolutely. And um, and, and as far as that South Carolina game, that's what I just remember. Uh, I remember Brandon Hawkins had a had an unbelievable game in knocking down threes, and then also – just one baseline drive that Evaldis Joe Cease had, and he 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 drove the the baseline and flipped it behind his head, and then Stephen Branch had a monster jam. I just remember that. <laughs> Stephen could jump out of the gym. That's that's for sure. He could almost jump over me if he wanted to. <laughs> uh, Neil, this is Dave. I'm here now. I wanted to ask you um, how important I know that you want to see Coach Julie do well since you played for him, and how. How important it is for you for a former basketball player at East Carolina for us to really be relevant in basketball? I think it's a sleeping giant, you know. It's one of those things where I think he could turn it really quick and it'd be really nice for him to do it just because of, obviously, you know, my connection to him. I don't care who does it. I would have loved for Bill Herring to do it. I would have loved for Levo to do it, you know. I would have, you know, I don't care who does it. I just want somebody to do it, right? But, you know, we reference this all the time. It, you know, that I truly think we can become a basketball school versus a football school. So as crazy as Dowdy Ficklin was when we were, you know, putting 70 on Carolina and doing all those types of things, I think I think basketball can be head and shoulders above that. And one of the one of the things about basketball, uh, too, and a lot of people would laugh at you just because we've been so poor throughout our history – and like Coach Dooley said, this is a this is a build, not a rebuild. But um, with, with basketball, I mean, you've seen programs down through the years. I mean, we were in the same league with them in the CAA, um, VCU, George Mason, and then after we had moved on to Conference USA, those programs had Final Four runs. So, like you said, I mean, you never know. People would laugh at you if you say East Carolina can one day make it to the Final Four, but you never know. There's no reason it couldn't be us. You know, it's a different landscape than it was. You know, you see almost every year you're seeing something. You know, Butler went back to back, like you said, George Mason went. Uh, VCU went out there. Um, you know, the uh, uh, Florida Gulf Coast, their run, you know, before Dooley got there. And even Dooley won a tournament game with them. You know, just even now at this point to just say just for us to go – you know, to the NCAA tournament, and I and I appreciate that. That's what he says. That's our goal every year is to go to the NCAA tournament. You know, it's not. We don't want to go. You know, we want to win the CIT. We want to go to the NIT. Yeah, those are all great things too. But if we can get the NCAA tournament, I mean, that time of year with baseball starting up and the NCAA tournament going on, it, it would be crazy. And Neil, the very fact you and I were talking beforehand, basketball and baseball. I like what you said. Um, before the interview, maybe you can touch on it again. But the great thing about basketball and baseball is they actually crown a champion on the court and on the uh, on the field, on the diamond, versus a committee picking them and um, just picking, like, four brand-name teams, like in football. Yeah, absolutely. You know, football's its own beast, right? It, you know, they don't crown a national champion. You know, the, the NCAA doesn't crown a national champion. The thing is, you know, they only put four of them in. It, it's hard enough for the Big Ten doesn't get teams in there. The Pac-12 doesn't get teams in there. So for these committee members to take a chance on a, you know, a UCF or Memphis or, you know, Temple or East Carolina or anybody who has a real good season, you know, they, they, they're they going to think twice about that. But the great thing about baseball, and we've seen it, you know, with, you know, the Diamond Bucks hosting their regional and, you know, winning that thing. And, 
you know, if you're successful in basketball and baseball, those two sports, they can't keep you out, you know, and especially now. Like, we could have had a, a great year, uh, you know, won our league in the Colonial, losing the first round of the tournament, and you weren't getting in. You were hoping to get into the NCAA tournament. You know, my freshman year, we had a good good team and, you know, lost in double overtime in the first round of the, of the uh, Colonial Athletic Association. And they, you know, we were – thinking we were going to get in the NIT and, you know, we didn't even get a sniff at it. Whereas in the American now, if you're in the middle of the league and you have a good good year, you're getting in for sure. I don't know off the top of my head how many teams got in, but it was four or five, wasn't it, that got in the tournament last year? Or yeah, four. To to four. Play. So, you know, we may not be in a Power 5 conference for football, but we're definitely in Power 6 conference for baseball and for basketball. Yeah, We have, a heck, of a, we have a heck of a baseball league. Yeah, that's going to be basketball. Football. We, we yeah. got we got four teams in the top twenty five for football. They're going to if that continues, they're going to have to change it. If not, I think you sue. But that's a different conversation for a different. Time. Yeah, and it, you know we were talking about that off off air too. Is you know the biggest change that's going to make a difference for the football is you know those power five conferences are protecting their bottom dollar, right? Yep. They're you know those are millions and tens of hundreds of millions of dollars that they're getting. That it doesn't matter how good you are. They're not cutting that pie up until somebody else tells them to do it. And the, the person that's going to have to tell them to do it is going to be the networks. And the good yeah. thing we have, and the thing I love, is our is our you know our TV deal with ESPN. Yeah, it, the thing it does for our conference, even compared to the other you know group of five or group of six conferences, it just the fact that I can get every basketball game, every baseball game, every football game, everything's on TV. It's just, it's unbelievable. And, and, you know, it's ESPN. It may be on the phone, but, you know, it's going away from everybody turning on the TV and watching watching football or watching sports. A lot of people are watching it on their devices now, and that's, you know, so that could be a real game changer for our conference too. Yeah, I, I agree with you 100%. And the, the, the money is, is there now, not to the point of the so-called Power Five, but – our TV contract starting next year is worth around $8 million per school, and that's heads and shoulders above any of the other so-called group of five. I mean, uh, the only other school that even cracks a million is the Mountain West. Yeah. And so now we're getting $8 million per school. I mean, that, we, we are we, – this, and I'll tell you something else. And You can tell ABC put uh, SMU Memphis in primetime this week. The Americans becoming very important to, to the ESPN networks and football and basketball. And I'll tell you why. Because they, they've done it to themselves by the ACC network, the SEC network, the Big Ten network, the Pac-12 network. They need content for ESPNU and ESPN2, uh, yep. particularly in football because uh, of those networks having their own, the conferences having their own networks now. You know, on on Saturdays now in the fall, ESPNU is nothing but group of five conferences. So yeah. uh, the, the tide's turning a little bit in our favor overall, and that again is only going to help basketball. I mean, basketball, like you say, don't have to deal with the with the same crap football does, but there still is that you'll still hear that power five term thrown around during basketball season, which is nonsense because the American, the 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 Big East. And the the A10, and then you could you could even throw some of the other leagues in there, like uh, how the West Coast where Gonzaga plays and the Missouri Valley. Yep. There's tons of good basketball leagues. Absolutely, and basketball's a it's a non discrimination sport, right? It's not a you don't see the you know the the weapons the weapons races with basketball that you see with with football with the practice facilities. You know, obviously we have, you know, you have the practice facilities and stuff for foot, for basketball, but you look at how East Carolina was able to, you know, make the investment for a basketball facility, uh, you know, that has, you know, your Hall of Fame, your men's and women's teams in there, but they haven't made the commitment to the football facility for that. So it just shows you it's a little easier to compete on that level than it is, you know, on the football level. A follow-up thing, uh, or question I had regarding just how good the American is. I mean, you're talking about four teams being in a year ago, and with Temple, Houston, or Cincinnati, and UCF, UCF nearly pulling that uh, upset sure. against yeah. against Duke. Yeah, let that one slip away. 
and then also uh, Houston, very close to to making a run to the, the Sweet 16 or beyond. Uh, and then you have teams like Wichita State, who, like Coach Dooley said, and they were a NCAA caliber team late in the year. They just put themselves on so far um, in the hole that they didn't have a way into the tournament without winning the conference tournament. And then they, there they uh, go on that run and nearly win the NIT. And then you have everything that Penny Hardaway is doing at Memphis. So it's just a tremendous league. You look up and down our schedule, and it's just like, holy moly, once the league starts, you're just like, you know, you look at it and you're, you you want to be able to say, yeah, we should win that game, we should win that game. And every game, you're just like, you just don't know. And especially with our roster, with the turnover, until we see a couple games and get through the next week or so, we'll have a pretty good idea of what we have. Um, you know, so, but it, it's going to be amazing. You know, you're going to have your two lane games and, you know, things like that. But, you know, Tulsa is always good. Wichita State's always good. Houston's going to be dominant again. Who knows what's going to happen with Memphis? We had them flat beat on the road last year and let it get, let them get off the hook. You know, that's the same coaching staff that's there, and they had players then. They don't have the number one recruits, but, you know, you just never know. They're going through the same thing we're going through. You know, a new roster, how's it going to gel? Or, you know, at their level, the difference they have is they've got guys that are, they're one and done. So they're thinking, I got to get mine. So are they there to play like they're on a team and to kind of, you know, rebuild Memphis? Or are they just kind of a, hey, this guy was my AAU coach, and, you know, he's pretty cool. He's going to let me shoot it as much as I want, you know. How's all that going to work for Memphis? You know, I'm sure it'll work out fine, but, you know, are they going to go on a run like Houston did last year where, you know, they were on ESPN two times a week and just, you know, blowing people out? I don't think so, but, uh, you know, the opportunities there for Memphis to really be good. And, then, and you talk about Tulane. Obviously, Tulane was um, in last place a year ago, but then just the quality of this league, I mean, you talk about them hiring a guy like Ron Hunter who had built such a remarkable program um, that was an NCAA tournament team at Georgia State. Oh, absolutely. For, 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 for them to be able to make that kind of hire. <laughs> well, you look at a you look at a school like Tulane, right? They're very similar to East Carolina right now. Um, right. You know, they've they've made investments in their facilities uh from their basketball uh, arena remodel, their football stadium obviously. And now they're starting to, you know, see the dividends on the football side of things for them, right, which we can kind of see on the horizon with Coach Houston, right? Uh, so their basketball team, I feel, is a step behind ours yet, but their football team took a step ahead of us. So, you know, they're very similar to where we are. So they're having the exact same discussions that we're having where they're like, hey, you know, uh, you know, they're in their first year where we were last year with Coach Dooley to where now they're going to be like, you know, Who's he going to bring in or how's he going to do? So they're going to kind of have their growing pains this year, but, you know, there's nothing to say they won't be successful moving forward and, and just help increase, you know, the strength of our conference overall, just like we're trying to do. Coach, Absolutely. Their, their coach, uh, Tulane's coach, uh, evidently at, at media day, uh, guaranteed they weren't going to finish last. Well, somebody's going to finish last. <laughs> <laughs> Well, it ain't going to be East Carolina. I'll promise right. you that. And so, yeah. <laughs> well, who's it going to be? It's not going to be Tulane. It's not going to be East Carolina. <laughs> you know, it's somebody's going to be. You know, somebody's going to disappoint and somebody's going to surprise. Yeah. Um, I don't think East Carolina's going to surprise people. Um, I think Tulane's probably a year behind. You know, they're you know they're probably got another year at the bottom before they can really compete to get out of the bottom. But I now, you know, you say I you had to put my you- money on it. You said you don't think East Carolina is going to surprise people? I do not because uh, they saw how much I think they're expecting us to do a little bit. We're going to, you know, we're going to get their attention when we come in. You know, we're not going to be a Tuesday game that come in and they're looking forward to their Friday or Saturday game, right? Right. Um, We're still we're 10th or 11th. 11th. They picked us 11th, but yeah. But who, who's voting on that? Is that the coaches voting or coaches, is that your, yeah. you know? Okay. Yeah. So you know. 10th or 11th, but we'll see. You know, yeah. I'll I'll put my money on on East Carolina. So, yeah, I, I get what you're saying, though, Neil. Even the, even though we're projected to be there near the bottom, um, that that these guys know that when they play the Pirates, um, how competitive we were in most games last year, um, with the exception of a 
of of a few. I mean, and pretty much, I mean, I'd say what fourteen or fifteen out of our eighteen games last year, with the exception of those two Houston games and maybe another, that when we were right there um, for the biggest part of our games. Yeah, we're not just running the six, seven freshmen out there, you know. Right. So, you know, we're not who we were last year. And like you said, we competed last year. But, uh, and the fact else... that... Sorry, go ahead, Dave. I was just going to mention the fact that I'm glad that you said that, uh, Neil, about uh, coaches. the coaches have a tremendous amount of respect for Dooley and then the staff, like you and I were talking about beforehand. I mean, they, they these guys eat, sleep, drink, recruiting. I mean, they really do. We talked to Rockefeller last week, and... He just uh, – you love the guy because he is a competitor. Uh, he Some of the coaches don't like recruiting, and if you don't like recruiting, you shouldn't be coaching. Um, and he, these guys, all, every single one of them know basketball. They know, like, coaches and contacts and all that. And it comes down to, I think that my prediction, I think we're going to be finished about eighth. I really do. I, I really think that – well, um, we're not going to make the leap that some casual fans would like for us to make, but I think that we're going to be um, – we're not going to be 11th. I, I can tell you that. I don't think we're going to finish last. I don't really think we're going to be 11th. I think, you know, Neil, uh, you're a basketball player. I, I felt like there were games last year we had the opportunities to wide open shots and we just couldn't make them. I mean, you got to be able to make – not saying you're going to make 70, 80 percent of your shots, but they had a lot of wide open – two and three pointers they they just couldn't drop they couldn't hit them you've got to be able to shoot it um and you got to have the the talent for that when you're your bell cow so Jaden last year when he wasn't when he was guarded by a seven six kid you got to have somebody else that can step up you know that's just and that's what we looks like we have this year so you know I, i'm just i'm really excited you know it's I was excited last year, but I'm just, I'm ready for tomorrow. You know, like I was mentioning off air, I've been looking for a line anywhere I can find a betting line on this, just to get an idea of what people are thinking about us. <laughs> have I you just found one? Find it. I have not found it. I can't find a line anywhere. I've been on every online bookie. I've been looking at ESPN everywhere. Nobody has a line, and I don't blame them. They don't know. You know, like you were saying, VMI lost. You know, their top guy and. You know, we have our top guy back, and but we have all this different, all these new pieces. You just, you know, you just, you just never have an idea. But I just kind of want to know what the thought is out there on us. You know, what what people's impression is. You know, from a from a from a money money place, so to speak. Kind of take you back. Don't bet on the pirates. I try not to bet with my heart, right? But I've. I've bet on the football team all year round, and so I'll, you know, if I can find a line, and it's a decent line, there's a chance I'll be putting some some of my greenbacks down on uh, the Pirates. So. According to the sports line, the, the money line on this game is ECU minus 450. <laughs> so 450, you know, that's, a, that's one where they would expect ECU to win the game, but it's not a shocker if they lose the game, right? It's not a thousand or a two thousand dollar money line bet. Yeah, but, uh, but I don't see a point for it. I just see. Uh, I just see. Uh, I would say uh, a, a minus four hundred line in, in in the American for us against the BMI at home. I would say that's probably about seven and a half eight points. Yeah, I see it right here. Uh, again, this is uh, open at seven and a half. Yeah. Uh, Joe Neal, man. Yeah, you know, are you a bookie or something? Are you a bookie? Uh, you might be a little bit of a degenerate, but yeah, you know. uh, I've had a little the, bit. The over, the, the over under is uh, is one fifty point five. Okay, so you seven know, and we, a half. We, I, I believe I take that, Neil. Yeah, that's. Yeah, I, 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 I think agree, we'll especially playing at home. And I think uh, we'll cover. You know, I think we'll score one twenty, and they'll score thirty. So <laughs> that gets us to the 150. <laughs> I like that. I like that a lot. But something I was going to piggyback on, Neil, is on the point you were making earlier, just talking about how you feel that our basketball program is a sleeping giant. Uh, and you take a look at it down through the years, going back to your days. I mean, we we actually averaged about five, five and a half thousand in the CAA um, playing the likes of VCU and uh, James Madison, et cetera. And um, Minji's was a hostile place to play. 
uh, most nights. And then uh, UNC Wilmington, that would always be a, a sellout. And then uh, you you also had other games, um, the the Marquette wins when they were ranked ninth in the nation. You had that Georgia game that Kyle referenced earlier. Uh, you you had uh, Ole Miss, I know, came in under Coach Herring's time. Um, Louisville, so you, with yeah, Louisville. Louisville. So you have isolated games. NC State, yeah. uh, when we knocked them off, when Coach Mack was leading us. But you had those times where you've seen what Menjis can be. You, the CIT run, you saw it. Uh, the, the Pirate Nation really got behind the program then. So I just can't wait to see when Coach Dooley and his staff get this thing rolling, what Menjis is like. Well, yeah, my freshman year, we opened up with uh, three conference wins at home over the holidays. And then we went to Old Dominion, who I believe – in 95, or I guess 96, the spring of 96, they may have been in the NCAA tournament. I'm not sure it was either them or VCU. I'm not, I don't know off the top of my head, but we went up to the scope when they were playing at the scope in downtown. And we went up there and we darn near, this is 1996, we darn near had more people there than Old Dominion did on their court. And that was with 3 and 0 in the seat in the Colonial. So the nice thing about basketball is it's 8,000 seats. You can get in the game for 10, 20 bucks, have a great night of entertainment. It's not like there's only five or six games. You got to pay 50, 60 bucks. You got to put your whole day out there. Basketball is a different breed. You go to work, you're at the water cooler. Man, East Carolina's playing uh, Memphis tonight. How much for tickets? 25 bucks. Shoot, I'll get, take my high school kids out there. You know, it's, it's cheap entertainment and, you know, it, it can take off so easy. It's just, it's like kerosene. You put a, put a, put a match on it and it's just going to blow up. And the roof is going to come off when this team is, uh, you give this uh, coaching staff, Kyle, I'll give him credit. He said a year ago, if we can keep this coaching staff together for about four or five years, especially, I mentioned that to Coach Rockerford, by the way, Kyle. But if All we right. mit- keep this, uh, that you said that, I said, if we keep this coaching staff together, like you said, Kyle, I mean, the possibilities are endless. When you have Coach Chilius, Rafael Chilius, who was the right-hand man to Kevin Ollie, they won a national championship. He's He had a really big relationship with uh, Charles Coleman, is my understanding, and uh, was recruiting him from day one. That's why it gave us the opportunity over the likes of uh, what Bubba Duke and uh, Pitt and some other guys. Wait, Wake, Wake Forest. Yeah. Yeah, he uh, committed from Wake. He also had the relationship um, he had uh, helped get – Batumba Baruti to uh, Washington, so I can't wait to see um, Batumba because you've you've heard um, just the player that he is. What and he's six seven and can um, and can handle it. He can he can take it to the hole and then also uh, hit the three. And so can't wait to see him tomorrow night. Yeah, and, and I'm jealous of of you know Jeff Charles and uh and uh, the gentleman with the bow tie on ESPN that comes on. Nate Ross. Nate Ross. <laughs> Nate Ross. You know, I'm jealous of both of them for getting to say Batumba Baruti over and over again during a basketball game. <laughs> <laughs> it's going to be fun. This, and, uh, Neil, I was going to say this. Uh, the group of guys that he's got right now, I mean, I obviously love basketball, but it's going to be exciting brand of basketball that Dooley can play when you like the uh, – when you got guys that are long and lean, you got three seven footers. I mean, you got guys now that uh, certainly can be rim protectors. You got guys that are, can play the wing. I mean, just uh, post them up. You just uh, what is it, Bubba? We got about three guys that can play point guard. My memory serves me right. Yeah, you, you got mm, Tremont Robinson White, and then uh, Tyree Pig Jackson. Then you also have uh, Tristan Newton, um, the freshman from out in El Paso, who's six five. And uh, Coach Dooley said that. Uh, although he's a little lean right now, that he did a pretty good job of taking care of the basketball in those uh, closed scrimmages against NC State and especially Wake Forest. So then that was encouraging because I heard earlier today, and today being Monday, uh, that uh, Tremont Robinson White will be out against VMI, but uh, Tyree, Jack- Tyree Jackson is a, it's a game time decision, if I'm not mistaken. That's right. And, you know, uh, by the way, guys, I love uh, Tyrese. Apparently he's a good dunker. I had a question to Miles James. He said he loves Tyrese dunk. He's one of the guys he mentioned. But uh, I love his – his nickname is Pig, by the way, uh, Kyle. How do you like that? Yeah, Tyrese he's Pig. pig? Are you saying Pig? Like P-I-G, Pig? Yeah. Yep. 
And that's now, why nickname. does he have the nickname Pig? Is he a hog? I don't know. I want to find out. I love that nickname. It's hard to forget it. I want to say in an interview that I heard with one of the coaches, uh, I think that stems from maybe his uh, his mom or grandma, something growing up. Well, you know, if he becomes a star, we we got to start a winking at him. Anytime he does something, gets, or, or Zooey, one of the two, we got to, you know, just hear the whole damn place go, Zooey! Or yeah, he has a monster point, dunk. Just, just he has a one. monster dunk, and you can yeah. and have some pig noise or something. <laughs> I'm sure Morgan Aylers may have some fun with that one. Oh my God! Yeah, he that that's great. And then uh, to see the likes of uh, Jaden Gardner today at practice, I was out there and he's he's working on his free throws before practice there, Neil. And uh, just great to see a guy like him. But uh, him and Seth Day when I think they're the reason that I'm happy um, about these guys is they must feel really confident with they're bringing Seth Day back very slow. Um, even slower than what I anticipated, and I think it's because the depth we had where last year uh, he would have probably been brought, brought back faster. Oh, yeah, absolutely. And, you know, that's a, that's an exciting thing. If you can – as much time as you can buy for him and then just throw him into the mix, you know, that can give us a real shot in the arm here, you know, in a month or so. Neil, and they've been playing total, together. Total Go ahead, Dave. i got a random question was, for Neil. Okay, I was just making a quick point. They've been – Neil, they really like each other. That's one question that Kyle and I had and Bubba was like, how were they going to jail? Well, they've been playing pickup games way deep in – back in, I'd say, probably what, Bubba, the summertime? Somewhere in the summertime. They've been playing basketball together for a long – even though it's – I know there's a difference between pickup games and a real game, but that's still – Oh yeah, with, with, with the with the practice facility, that's the great thing. I mean, yeah. and it's so big for not only developing their games, but also developing the team chemistry and the way they can hang out and um, do what they need to do, be it studying or just or just lounging around, watching games, playing video games, whatever. And um, they have that access on twenty four seven three sixty five. Yeah, that's nice. Neil, I was going to ask you, I'm sitting here listening to your voice, and you sound like someone to me. Where are you from? I grew up. I'm a Min- I am I claim Minnesota is home, so that's where I consider home. But I've uh, I've been here in, in Dallas, Texas area for going on about 10 years now. Before that, I was down in Florida for six years. So I'm that you're in Dallas. The guy you sound like lives in Rockport, Texas. Oh, okay. And he's from Arizona. Yeah. Um, so I don't know where the hell that comes from with Minnesota, but you both live in Texas, so that's it, super strange. So you, it, yeah, you learn real quick, you know, talking to, you know, especially talking to the natives here in Texas, it's hard for me to even understand them. So, uh, you know, I'll talk to people from home, and they're like, you don't sound nothing like you're from Minnesota anymore. And I'm like, well, I haven't been in Minnesota in a long time. <laughs> well, maybe maybe that's what it is. Maybe it's just these words. Maybe it's just the... The random, you know, different accents, and y'all, y'all both picking up the Texas dialogue. That, because you, you sound probably, just, you sound just like a guy named Ted Fowler that does a podcast with Steve Austin. Uh, oh, you, really? You sound exactly like <laughs> Stunning Neil Punt. Is that what you're saying? Stunning, no. stunning Steve Austin. <laughs> yeah, no, no, he sounds he sound like he sounds like Ted Fowler. But okay. somebody, you, you, you guys are gonna have to look that up. But they sound exactly the same. That would be great. Neil, uh, what's your uh, so, I'll do random day for that. Yeah, Neil, I was going to say I was telling the guys, uh, especially Bubba. Uh, do you think it's possible that we can ever have a culture at East Carolina where we would say going to the NS- NIT would be a disappointment? In other words, where we're going to the tournament on a regular basis, the big dance? Absolutely, absolutely, without a doubt. And uh, if Coach Dooley didn't believe that, he wouldn't have that as his number one goal to go to the NCAA tournament. I want us to get to the point where going to the NC going to the NCAA tournament and not expecting to get to, you know, either playing from Thursday to Saturday or Friday to Sunday, that's a disappointment. You know, whereas a good year you're like, man, we made the Sweet 16. Then you have a, an elite year where you make the Elite Eight, and then you have a generational year where you say, hey, we made the Final Four. We had a real shot at the Final Four. You know, you look at like Gonzaga, they were nobody until they had a little run. You know, in the final, in the you know, in the NCAA tournament back in the late '90s, and they've maintained it for 20 years. So there's no reason why that can't be us. And the fact that we're in a basketball state with uh, the state of North Carolina is always known for 
college basketball. And I think now it's getting better because of um, all athletes, period, for football, basketball, baseball, anything, because the population is uh, growing to the point where we're number ninth in the country, Neil, as far as population. Yeah, it's, un- it's unbelievable, you know, just the conference we're in. You know, we can't speak of it enough. Our conference, you know, I'll put our conference even against your, you know, your larger conferences, you know, but compared to like the big West or, you know, any of those, we're heads and shoulders above those conferences. So the opportunity is there for us to be really good. And that helps in recruiting. That just makes it easier, right? We we can't recruit to our history. We can recruit to, you got the best players in the country come to this conference and, you know, you're going to be on ESPN. You're going to go to the NCAA tournament. You know, you got coaches, that have national championship rings. They've been in the big games. They've been, you know, we have ties to Kansas and Bill Self and, you know, all over the place. It's, you know, there's no reason why, there's really no reason why a recruit who has an open mind wouldn't give uh, consideration to East Carolina with our facilities, our location. It's a true college town, um, great conference. You know, we we have all the resources that everybody else has from the private, you know, from the flights to, you know, the practice facility to, you know, we're also a football school. You know, it, it it's the entire package in East Carolina. And, no um, Neil, I don't know if you've seen the excellent feature that uh, Stephen Igo, HoistTheColors dot net, the Q and A's he's done with all the roster. Um, so Empire Nation has an opportunity to get to know the guys a little bit. So many new pieces, um, but that's been really good. And you've had guys um, like Suggs and different ones um, where they've referenced on that awesome exposure that the American gives you in terms of. ESPN platforms and CBS Sports Network because, like, back when you were there and when we talked about that South Carolina game down in Columbia, and that game I think was Fox Sports South, and then you would occasionally have your HTS game or two and maybe one game on ESPN2 or something. But um, we were largely not on TV, so that's just – Yeah. that That's w, huge. Yeah. WITN would have two or three games a year, and right. that's just in Greenville. Just you know, Eastern Carolina WITN. Oh man, we're on we're on WITN tonight. Like, wow, this is a big deal. You know, like we actually have to deal with TV timeouts. We didn't use like people forget when you weren't on TV, you didn't have your sixteen, twelve, eight, and four timeouts. The game just rolled. You know, they didn't just stop it for the heck of it. They didn't care about radio. You know, so the games would get over real quick. So when you were on TV, it was a big deal. But uh it, you know, like I said, you know, when my, when when I was getting recruited and I had signed with East Carolina, the only way I could find the scores, so this is in 1995, spring of 96, the only way you could get the updated scores was to watch CNN. CNN yeah, had, had a, ticker. <laughs> a ticker. They had a ticker on the bottom that had every single college game. And you would watch 300 and some games go by. You know, it, wasn't, it was a couple hundred games from like yeah. the school of the of the blind facing St. Mary's Academy. You know, and then it would go two or three times in a way. And you know, you'd be watching a game, and it was like we're up two with 10 seconds to go, and you're like you're waiting five minutes for your score to come by again. You know, so just how far it's come for East Carolina from then. Right, you can find East Carolina at any time. I can find every football game. To be able to watch every single baseball game, I didn't miss a single baseball game on my phone or my computer last year. You know, it's just it's unbelievable. Well, that's about to get even better because uh, with ESPN Plus coming aboard for the Olympic sports card next year, uh, you, not only with a baseball feed, you know, where it was available for ECUPirates dot com, now you're just going to hit that ESPN app and you'll be able to watch. Uh, the baseball game, and then uh, if you're interested in the baseball race, after our game's over, you can go flip it over to the uh, Memphis game or whoever. Yeah, absolutely. You know, the the pieces are there for us, right? We can't really say, hey, we really need this. If, if there's one thing I could say that we could use, you know, as a university, and we've, you know, it's in the talks, obviously, is the training table. You know, if we can get that, that puts us right there. You know, if they can say, hey, you're going to come here, you're going to have a nutritionist, you're going to have food, you're going to have access to all this stuff, you know, we're going to, 
build you up and, you know, you're going to be a lean, mean fighting machine. If we can get that include, you know, get that up and running, you know, then, then there's really, I'm not saying excuses, but, you know, there's no reason we can't be successful. We have a and we did now. Add, does, does it not carry over to basketball, guys? It does. Well, she's Christina Parrish, just a nutritionist, but I think Neil was saying a more, in addition to the nutritionist, we need to have more, uh, more of, I guess, a plan. And certainly she's uh, available for all 19 sports, is my understanding. Right, Bubba? Yeah, that. And then um, kind of what, as far as Kyle saying, as far as it came over from football, I think what we have right now is kind of a makeshift training table where where we're having meals catered and brought in. I mean, right. and not, but rather than an actual facility. So, Correct. So uh, in, yeah. in, you're right. In, in the future, I mean, I think that's where it's going to get to, but it's certainly a step in the right direction. And then we have the uh, – um, the juice bar and um, and the, where you make the shakes and all those sorts of things. And then along those same lines, and the big thing is is now that we're um, per Sy Seymour, I think it was, um, able to charter uh, every single game. So that's going to be huge. I mean, every single game within the conference. So that's going to be absolutely huge, um, being able to uh, hop on a plane and get back to Greenville after a game instead of hanging around until the wee hours of the morning. Yeah, and, uh, you know, Maybe uh, maybe for that dining hall or the, or the training table for the student athletes, uh, maybe that can be built on uh, as part of the uh, football practice facility complex. Yes. Or practice facility. Um, kind of kill two birds with one stone. Yeah, that'd be perfect. Yeah, it would be tremendous. And that's you're right about Bub, uh, Bub and Kyle and I talk about all the time, Neil, but uh, what it comes down to, I think, is uh, when I was in the press box Saturday night, it just uh, I know that we spent a lot of money on Town Bank Tower, but I just uh, where we come from, from just that standpoint, and then when you have the nutritionist, so we have a it's a baby step in the right direction for the training table, uh, the with that facility, and then with look when uh, the uh, I can't we're wait to see money. the graphics. Let's put waste of money feeding Dave Richmond Miller Mushroom in the in the uh, town big town back tower. And, uh, <laughs> well, you're you've got a hey, you've got a credential. You can come up there anytime, brother. I'm good, man. I'm good. I'm with the people. I'm with the people. Yeah. Well, it's uh, it's also good. I tell you what, the uh, one thing, another thing about the town big tower that's great is uh, the very fact of uh, the internet works tremendous. By the way, guys, so it's nice to be able to uh, have the scores and uh, be able to. You got five bars there. That's something that we desperately need in Dowdy Ficklet Stadium. Is uh, the the wire the uh, internet is terrible, uh, the wireless, and that's something that I've been preaching for. I, Dave, I really don't know what they can do about it. I, I mean, it, 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 you know, I, I tell you what helps when we have a crappy crowd like we did Saturday night. Your internet's a lot better. Uh, but I was so into that game, I didn't care about checking any scores. Uh, well, yeah. I mean, yeah, I don't know what to do, man. It's it, Verizon and U.S. Cellular, you know, I, I don't know how much more they can boost it right there at the stadium when you get thirty to 50,000 people and you well, apparently it's just bandwidth. 2014, they were uh, the guy that was sitting behind me at the time was in charge in the meetings, and apparently it, called, it was an $8 million investment in 2014. And, of course, now it's 2019, so it's no telling what it would maybe 10 or 11, who knows, but – it's it's uh, to network that to get it to be where we need it to be is probably it's probably in that neighborhood a ballpark of ten million dollars now is what my guess would be I don't know but um, we desperately need that it's something that like the guys on this podcast talking right now we don't care about as much but if you want to get the twenty something uh, the millennials and the younger generations to go to games we've got to have uh, stuff up to date I used to remember it was twenty dollars for a ticket Neil now it's sixty. Uh, to go to a game. So it's a, a lot of things have changed, but we've got to have the technology up. Or a lot of guys can say, I can sit in my recliner at the house. I've got Internet. I've got all this technology, laptops, uh, all the iPads and all that stuff, and I can be 10 feet away from the a restroom, and I can uh, – the adult beverages, I can save money. I don't want to worry about drinking and driving and all that stuff. So – um, we got to worry. That's something that we're going to have to worry about. Good pitch there, Dave, to get people to stay home. That was good. <laughs> no, I'm just saying. I'm saying we're competing against that. I love to be at the games. I'm just saying that the 
the fans that we need and the, the butts in the seats, so to speak. We, we got to do more to make an no, I, I agree with you. We're getting off top of here. I agree with you, but uh, you know, I, I, I 100% we need to do everything we can to get people to come out to the games for football and basketball and improve the game day experience. But the biggest thing we need to do, and the biggest thing that's going to help people get 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 their butts in the seats is to win basketball and football games. Oh, no but doubt. there are things. And since we're talking basketball, at Menji's, to me, it's so damn uncomfortable in there. The the If you're a big guy, a tall guy, or a fat guy, or a fat and tall guy like me, it's miserable sitting in those damn seats. I mean, I I got no room for my ass, no room for my knees. Well, um, there's, there's so you're gonna sit on the bleachers then, right, Bubba? The, the the concessions, the concession choices, which I heard those are gonna be improved this year for basketball. So that's good. Uh, they're gonna have more concession choices for basketball. Uh, different things like that to make the game day experience better um, definitely need to be done. Yeah, the sight line too. If you're at the top of Menji's. The sight line is terrible. You can't see. Uh, I'm into the games. I'm saying, how many timeouts does East Carolina have? How many timeouts does Memphis have? Whatever. And you, like where I'm sitting now, I'm fine. I'm on one of the end zones, and Bubba is on the other end zone. Um, actually, I think you're on the bleachers, right, Bubba? You're actually you and your dad have upgraded your seats. But um, if, if you're sitting in the top of the arena, you cannot see the scoreboard at all. You have no idea what the score is or anything. That's do, my do, biggest complaint. Do, do any of you guys know, is it possible to put one of those big, uh, I don't know what they're called, the, the scoreboard at the middle Jumbo of the No, well, yeah, but the, the big, you know, square, all four sides, yeah. scoreboard in the middle of the ceiling. I, I would heard. say, you know, at the, the issue they have, I know they looked at it when I was there. The issue they had then was just the height of the ceiling versus the clearance from the yeah. floor, but you look at, like, Cameron Indoor, they have one, and theirs isn't, you know, I wouldn't say their roof is considerably higher than Minji's, but they've made it work. But with the technology the way it is, you can have the smaller ribbon boards, you know. I would think it'd be possible, you know, but would, would that still help you be able to really see it from that back row on the on those sides? I don't know, but. That would be great. I, I just that's my biggest thing is the, being able to know. Like, I mean, you want to keep up with the game, and uh, certainly there's other ways to keep up with the score. Now we have phones and tablets and all that stuff you can take, but still, it would be great to be able to be able to see what who was the you know foul called on, you know, that different things like that. Look up at the scoreboard. But anyway, hey, you know, and, and we no longer have a dying horn. <laughs> <laughs> That that was that was pathetic last year. That was ridiculous. Yeah. Is that sounded like something you would hear would have heard back in uh, Hoosiers? <laughs> but and then along those same lines, I know we're going to wrap this thing up. But Neil, I know, I'm sure you've seen these things on social media. The graphics in Minji's now, like the the oh, new yeah. uh, big East Carolina basketball, it looked awesome. And then also uh, going from the upper arena down to the low arena, that stairwell or those stairwells, you, you had the lyrics to EC Victory, the fight song, and I thought that was sharp. Yeah, I think it looks great. You know, whatever they can do, you know, those are, are smaller, you know, air quotes, small dollar items that can really kind of enhance the atmosphere a little bit, you know. So I'm all for it, man. If, you know, like like you guys have mentioned, it's a build. It's not a rebuild. So you start building by doing little things like that and kind of building a culture, you know, and that just kind of – Every person that comes in there, whether it's a little elementary age kid or a middle schooler, and they see that stuff and they think that's cool and not their team, you know, and they had a great experience there and they turn into us, right? Where you just all of a sudden you're a team, you're a fan and that's your team. You know, you don't, you don't go with the tobacco road teams. You, you go with East Carolina, your hometown team. And all of that plays into that. No question about it. And it comes down to, as uh, Kyle said, winning. And once, uh, especially basketball and football, once you start winning, it uh, definitely gives you a lot more stuff uh, for sure down the road. Training tables, the uh, indoor practice facility, a lot of stuff. People will start giving money again because they they see with their eyeballs the improvement. So, no question yeah, about absolutely. it. Neil, thank you. Thank you, man. I know that I was looking at the time. I didn't know we would talked this long, but uh, we, we thank a lot of you. Appreciate what you did for the program. Thank you so much for 
being on our podcast on a regular basis. And thank God basketball season is here. Yep, we're ready to go, and uh, I'm I'm game anytime you guys are, and I appreciate everything you guys are doing for the athletic department and the university as well. You've been listening to the Sports Objective Podcast. Join us next time as the guys will be objective, and the objective is sports.